there's a story from the Middle Ages about a monk, an esteemed monk, a serious man, who was an actual historical figure named Bernard of Clairvaux. And the story goes that Bernard was kneeling in front of a statue of the Virgin Mary, praying, meditating, singing a song of praise, one specially composed for Mary. And when he gets to the fourth verse of that hymn, Monstra te esse matrim, show me you are my mother, the statue in front of him comes to life, bears her breast, and propels three squirts of breast milk right into Bernard's mouth. <laughs> This is the kind of story that makes me love the Middle Ages. <laughs> It's a jolt from history. You know, it may strike us as preposterous, a little perverse, but I like to imagine how and why such a story could have had real resonance for real, normal, thoughtful human beings in the Middle Ages. I think we can be sure it was a shocker for them, too. You know, shocking stories are memorable ones. Those are the ones that get repeated again and again, as this one was. But I think we should also think about it as they did, as a metaphor for what would have been an ideal relationship between humans and the divine. Playing off an idea we can understand, the intimacy between a mother and a child, so that anyone who heard it would have been reminded that the Virgin Mary is one who nourishes, who quenches a thirst, who satisfies a longing, who hears and who responds. And whether you're a religious person or not, I think you can appreciate a religious sensibility that values that. But what is germane to our gathering today is that a work of art is at the center of that story, that interaction so powerfully expressed between a lowly human and a responsive divinity is enacted through a statue. While this story circulated in the Middle Ages as a model for a devotional experience, I'm wondering if, for a moment, we could think about it as a model for a viewing experience, as a way of pondering one person's relationship with one work of art. Bear with me. Visitor engagement, the interactive experience, these are big ideas right now in the museum world, and we're busy promoting works of art you can climb in and climb on and things you can do related to art with your smartphone and your tablet. Many of these are wonderful, but I'm wondering if Bernard's story can't point us towards another kind of interactivity. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I don't think we're quite ready for the precise form of interaction that we find in Bernard's story. I'm a curator. Food and drink makes me very nervous in the galleries. <laughs> But in the end, what museums want, what artists want, what I think most visitors want, is for works of art to speak to us, to nourish us in some way, to satisfy a longing. We want works of art to enchant us and to be enchanted. And that's where the Middle Ages has something to offer, because they believed art could do that, that it could respond to you, relate to you. And though they were capable and often did sit back and admire the nice materials and the, good, the fine craftsmanship, there was also an understanding that once a work of art was created, the artist, that person whom we moderns focus our attention on, well, that person would step out of the way, become anonymous, and allow the work of art to have a presence all its own. For art had power. It had charisma. Now this, this is an icon. <laughs> you know, we're, we're tossing that word icon around pretty indiscriminately. <laughs> especially today, but um, we use it, what, to mean celebrities, work, oh, famous works of art, uh, classic consumer products. 
navigational devices on a computer screen. And interestingly, the relationship between icons like this and those other kinds of icons isn't quite as far apart as you might think. Icon, it's a Greek word. It meant picture, likeness. But it could also mean a reflection, a vision, an apparition. Icons retain a, a kind of paradox. They're, they're a thing right before you, something you feel you could touch. Yet their power derived not from their material presence, but from who or what they depicted, what they conjured. They were understood to have something called charis, another Greek word, an evocative one, meaning grace, allure, beauty, charm. Icons possessed this kind of special power. And then this is where we get our notion of charisma from. In the same way that we talk about a charismatic individual as having that special something that attracts others to him or to her, a kind of gift that, well, they don't seem to work at, but seem somehow to be, they seem to be blessed with. This is also how icons were understood. Now, <laughs> I need to clarify a small technical point. I think that's my job here today. Icon, that is a Greek word <laughs> that was, you would have heard in Byzantium, in that part of Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean where the Orthodox Church held sway. But in the Latin West, where the Catholic Church was the church in power, the word you would more likely hear was imago, a Latin word, where we get our word images from. And so though we have two strains of Christianity, two different artistic traditions, two sets of rituals, both shared this idea that works of art could be charismatic. So we have wonderful stories, countless stories, of objects with extraordinary powers, paintings that can heal a sick individual, or sculptures that can protect an entire imperiled community. And then we have stories of bossy works of art, they're demanding, prone to jealousy. One such story involves a man, a ring, and this image here. A gold and jeweled encasement for the relics of Saint Foy. So in this story, the man is named William, and he strikes a deal with the blessed Foy. If she will see him through the difficult situation he was in, well, we don't know what that is, but if, if she'll see him through, he will give to her his best ring, one with a jasper. So, Foy does her part. Things turn out just fine for William. So, to do his part, he makes his way to Conque in central France, where the statue still sits today. But when he gets there, he thinks to himself, you know, I, I want to keep my ring. I, I kind of like it. I'll just give Foy cash instead. Should be fine. So he gives Foy through the statue, his money, begins to make his way home, and when he's about six miles from Conk, sleep overcomes him, and he wakes up and finds that that ring he had kept has disappeared. And it doesn't take him long to figure out what the problem is. Foy didn't want his money. Foy wanted that ring. So William turns around, trudges back to Conk, kneels down in front of the statue, begs forgiveness, and when he looks down, there's the ring. Well, and what does he do? He does what any of us would do. He turns that ring right over to Foy. So Foy makes out pretty well there. She gets both the money and the ring. She's smart, Foy. And William, well, he learns the important lesson that you don't play bait and switch with Foy. <laughs> I could go on, but I bet I know what some of you are thinking. These are charming stories, but they're just proof that the Middle Ages was a credulous age. <laughs> Everybody was, perceptions were, crowd, were clouded by uh, that dogmatic faith. But I'm here to tell you that would be problematic because the Middle Ages was full of skeptics, 
full of people, uncomfortable with miracle working, milk squirting, talking, speaking, demanding works of art. These folks are the deniers. <laughs> you know, they deploy rational arguments and sarcastic mockery, sometimes even bullying, to bring home their point that these incidents with art, they, they just can't be true. You know, and furthermore, they insist that art should only have a moral message. It should be educational. I, I don't like these people. <laughs> you know, they're smug, they're self-righteous. The more interesting people are those who situate themselves between the ardent believers and those adamant deniers. They, they kind of hedge their bets. I, I like to call them the expectant skeptics. So one such expectant skeptic is another Bernard. This is Bernard of Angers, and he is a cleric, a schoolmaster. He approaches everything he does in a properly skeptical manner. And he hears, he hears these stories about the wonder-working statues. He, he's pretty sure it's a lot of foolishness. But he decides to investigate the phenomenon. So he goes, he conducts his field work, he gathers his evidence, he takes notes. And in the midst of this dispassionate inquiry, he begins to doubt his own certainty. And a pivotal moment comes when he's face to face with a statue that would have looked something like, we hope, this. Like the statue of Saint Foy, this is a magnificent piece of medieval goldsmith's work. And like Foix, it has a commanding presence, largely by virtue of those wide open eyes, that unwavering gaze. So you need to imagine Bernard confronting crowds of people, kneeling before a statue like this. He's ready to dismiss it all as silly, superstitious, sacrilegious. And then the sculpture begins to pull him in. First, it's the glitz, right? all that gold and jewels. And then he notices how well it's made, the precision with which the face is formed. And then he notes, and I'm, I'm going to quote him here, so listen, because it's wonderful, that the statue seemed to see with its attentive observant gaze, the great many people seeing it, and to gently grant with its reflecting eyes the prayers of those praying before it. I love this. The locked stare between sculpture and spectator, the powerful reciprocating gaze, one set of eyes reflected inside another. Oh, this is heady stuff. The music is swelling. This is how we talk about the enchanted encounter of lovers. And it's also how we talk about charisma. It brings to mind one contemporary journalist description of the magnetism of Bob Dylan. When your eyes locked with his, she writes, it was as if he was looking at you, and only you. Now, isn't this what marks a charismatic individual, the sense that they somehow know you, understand you, are addressing you and you alone, even if you're one of thousands in a concert hall or one of millions looking at that person on a movie screen? And that brings us to an essential feature of the charismatic encounter. It's mutuality. Even as movie stars and musicians, the occasional politician, do that magic thing they do. <laughs> We're busy projecting onto them our own wishes, our own needs, our own thoughts. Charisma may seem as if it's something bestowed from on high, but it is equally a power conferred by the admirer, by the spectator. In so many of our medieval stories, it's the gaze of the viewer that gets that statue to speak and to move. It's that simple idea we've heard already. Much of the power of works of art is the power that we, as viewers, give it. 
So, I understand we might be hesitant to believe that a work of art's going to perform some miracle in front of our eyes. And I, I'll tell you a secret. Bernard of Clairvaux, that thirsty monk we began with, he would have been hesitant too. He, he never told that story about the milk-squirting virgin about himself. I think he would have, well, found it distasteful. <laughs> it was a story told about him after he died, and I don't think we should be surprised that someone in the Middle Ages would have wanted that to have happened to Bernard, because Bernard was known then, he's still known today, as a powerful spokesman for the experience of contemplation, which he described as a form of rapturous looking. The kind of absorbing experience, and this is Bernard's words here, can carry the watcher away in amazement and ecstasy. So, what did it take for a medieval viewer to enjoy a deeply engaged experience, an interactive experience, with a work of art? Well, it took belief. Not belief that a statue would come alive. No, no, we're talking belief with a capital B. You know, this is sincerely felt, widely embraced religion that offered an excuse and a framework for lengthy, thoughtful contemplation. And it was this big B belief that assumed such contemplation could yield revelation. So uh, how do I, how, how do any of us stand a chance? You know, we live in a highly secular age. You know, miracles, they're not really talked about in polite company. But I would ask, when standing before a work of art, is it possible for us to think of ourselves as expectant skeptics, ready to admire the glorious materials, the hand of the artist, but prepared, albeit cautiously, to give that work of art power, to acknowledge its charisma, to allow it to draw us in and cast its spell. Might we walk into a museum with something like religious belief, anticipating those works of art are going to come alive, interact with us, understand us, address us and us alone? even if we're not quite ready to drink the milk. Thank you.